Thank you, and I hope, um, and thank you for the organizers for, for including um, such a prominent focus on TB um, in this afternoon session. Um, we're all very aware of um, that the extent of the challenge when we talk about TB. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides. <laughs> thank you. So, um, um, realizing that there aren't many easy answers, but I'll try and give you the best overview I can in my introductory bit talking about MDR treatment as well, and then um, Steve uh, will talk about prevention and won't cover all the background sections that I will cover up front. Um, you're all aware that tuberculosis is the number one infectious disease killer on the planet, and that it's also the number one cause of death in people with HIV, um, causing around 1.6 million deaths every year. In children, we know that around a tenth of the global burden occurred in children under 15 years of age, uh, with an estimated 200,000 deaths happening. Mostly in children under five, we know that most children who die from TB never accessed care or treatment, and around a tenth of those who die, um, or the deaths occurred in children with um, co-infected with um, TB and HIV. The, we've already discussed the impact of COVID earlier today, but for TB, we've got good data um, to track what has happened to case notification in different countries. And here you can see on the x-axis, really, the impact of 2020 and on the uh, y-axis, uh, impact of 2021 compared to 2019, but just showing massive reductions in case notification in most of the big um, no, high incidence TB countries in the world, with the breakdown in the right hand corner. Essentially, this suggests that many, many patients went undiagnosed and untreated during the COVID disruption. And clearly, children with TB represent transmission at the community level. Increased transmission will imply increased um, caseload in children. Just quickly reflecting on, on COVID, um, we're all now familiar with um, coronaviruses that have spread into the human host multiple times in the past, but the three most recent um, transitions have been MERS and then SARS-1 and then SARS-2. I think there's no debate now anymore that it comes from a, a bat reservoir, probably with something like a raccoon dog as the intermediate host. But it's a reminder to us that um, with the changing world and the changing climate, there's an ever-increasing threat of emerging infections. It also reminds us that HIV is probably the most recent, recent, um, most recent um, um, previous major pandemic that have jumped the species barrier coming from chimpanzees um, with an African origin. And this is important when we re reflect on tuberculosis. So we've always thought that tuberculosis fits the same narrative that TB probably originated from an animal host many, many thousands of years ago. But the latest genomic evidence shows us that of all the TB lineages that we have, there's now been eight that's described, they all found in Africa. TB have an African origin. It spread around the world wherever human migration went. Of the three big lineages, lineage um, two, three, and four, that drive the global epidemic at the moment, um, they all really emerged in places of high human density, Europe, Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, all the animal strains of tuberculosis that we know of are very closely related to lineage six and clearly have a human origin. So if we think of chimpanzees or bats as the origin of SARS, we probably have to think of TB as the only disease where humans as far as we know, seem to be the ancestral host. And there's a lot of discussion why humans have been uniquely vulnerable um, for this um, introduction. And it probably didn't jump from another species. It probably come from soil. We know that mycobacteria in general are soil dwelling and water dwelling organisms. But it's the most likely explanation is that we are the only species on the planet to have ever controlled fire. And we know that fire is very closely related to indoor air pollution, 
airway inflammation and creating a respiratory pathway for transmission. And you can look at that PNA paper that really looks at the old archaeological evidence of indoor air pollution exposure in early hominids that lived in smoke-filled caves and how that may have opened a pathway for TB transmission. So really reflecting on probably the most ancient human disease um, that have originated in humans and then the impact of HIV, which is a relatively u recent introduction from our closest relative, the chimpanzee. All right, so I'll, I'll move back um, to drug-resistant TB, because I think that's just some of the recent insight that we've gained from all the genomic um, um, analysis that's now available. So thinking about the drug-resistant TB disease burden, you're all familiar with um, where the TB and drug-resistant TB burden is found in the world. It's important to emphasize that children get TB where adults spread TB. For a long time, we thought that MDR-TB was less transmissible and that therefore children would be protected against MDR-TB, but we know that's not the case. There's very good genomic evidence now that MDR-TB are as, or is as transmissible as drug-susceptible TB, at least the currently circulating strains, and that children are as vulnerable to get MDR-TB if it's spread and coughed out by adults as they are with drug-susceptible TB. So that's why you see the, the map of where children are found with TB. It's very similar to where we find adults with TB, and if you look at the top right-hand corner, just the overlapping epidemics, you can see the list of countries where both TB, HIV, and MDR, TB is highly prevalent. And where you would expect most cases with childhood MDR, TB to present. So if we look at the numbers that are available, um, you can see on the left bottom corner the estimated number of cases globally with drug-resistant tuberculosis. In red, um, the number of, uh, in blue, the number of people diagnosed, and in red, the number treated. So on the whole, um, there's a very small treatment gap. So if you get diagnosed, in most instances, you get treated. But that implies, unfortunately, that diagnosis is only available in those specialist centers that have MDR treatment. And there's a massive gap, but that gap is nearly all driven by diagnosis. And if you look at the right-hand side, the number of people reported um, to have been treated um, for MDR-TB, you can see that a very, very small number of that is children. We've said that about 10% of the global epidemic of all TB cases occur in children, but for MDR-TB, only a small fraction of those accessing care is children. Um, we know that the current estimates are that there's about 30,000 children that develop MDR-TB every year, but more than 80% of these kids are not detected, and less than 5% of them are able to access appropriate treatment and care. You can see the countries where children at the moment have, I wouldn't say that they have got the easiest access, but these are the only countries in the world where large numbers of children with MDR-TB are currently being treated, more than 100 kids. On the whole, there's now 80 countries where children with MDRT have, MDRTB have been treated, but often in very small numbers. Um, we've already highlighted the big diagnostic dilemma and gap, and you can see that this is most pronounced in children under five, and this is true for drug susceptible, but even more so for drug-resistant tuberculosis. So how do we diagnose MDRTB in children? At the moment, really, we are reliant on either culture, which is essentially non-available in the TB endemic world, or expert, which luckily is now becoming the frontline test in most TB affected countries in the world, expert or other not, so no, um, nucleic acid amplification tests. Um, and the ultra is the more sensitive version that we prefer for child TB diagnosis. Um, the remarkable thing of the expert test is that it detects both the presence of MTB, but at the same time it gives you a signal of likely rifampicin resistance. Once you detect that, we need to do former um, additional um, drug resistance workup to know what the full drug resistance profile is. There's now an expert XDR cartridge that gives you additional information on INH, the quinolones, the injectables which we no longer use, and ethionamide. We can also use line probe assays or whole genome sequencing in very select settings where this is available, or phenotypic 
DSD, which depends on culture. Um, s many programs in the world still require a bacteriologically confirmed MDR diagnosis before you can access care. We know that even in the best of circumstances, expert has low sensitivity in children. Uh, probably around 30% of children with clinically diagnosed TB will be expert positive. So even if we have access to this test, it can never be a barrier to care. WHO now recognizes that children can be treated for pre presumptive MDR TB. And this is normally made when a child is diagnosed with clinical TB in the presence of recent household or very close MDR TB exposure, in which case you should regard the child as having the same drug resistant strain as the likely source case. Um, while I talk about diagnosis, I should just emphasize that in any child that you think about TB or MDR TB, ensure that they're also tested for HIV and treated for HIV. As soon as possible, it's part of the package. I shouldn't um, in, uh, <laughs> belabor this with, with, the, with this audience. When we use genomic tests, I think uh, it's just important to be aware of some of the limitations and, and, and the things that we should always um, be on the lookout for. Um, an example of one of the, um, uh, the, the frailties of the expert test is that expert detects rifampicin resistance in what we call the, um, the rifampicin resistance determining region. It's an 81 base pair sequence that um, really represents, we thought, all rifampicin resistance, but probably about 98% of rifampicin resistance. But you can get mutations outside the RRDR. And in places like Swaziland or, or Eswatini, you can see here that there's a specific mutation, that 591 mutation, that's been missed by experts. And you can imagine if you miss an MDR diagnosis, that is the strain that will spread. And in Swaziland, in Swaziland at the moment, um, the majority of MDR TB cases are not detectable by expert because this clone has spread, and this can happen in other parts of the world as well. We haven't yet seen that spread beyond the borders, far beyond the borders of Swaziland. The other concerning thing is that this specific strain that is spreading, that's expert undetectable, also has higher rates of resistance against some of our second line drugs like um, clofazamine and pedacolin. Um, moving on to treatment, we know that um, Excellent MDR treatment is available with good outcomes. Um, treatment of monoresistant um, TB um, is fairly standard. We can replace the resistant drug with a quinolone, often levofloxacin, and I'm not going to belabor what's said there. Um, for MDR TB, we have now a new classification of the second line drugs, which arrange them according to their potency. And you can see that the quinolones, bedaquiline and linazolid now are now the, the category A drugs. The other one to mention is the laminate, which is here a category C drug, but it's recognized as a potent drug similar to protominate, which is used in the BPAL regimen in adults, but not yet available in children because of concerns around testicular toxicity that may be relevant in, in children. Um, so all these second line drugs are now available in child friendly formulations through the drug, global drug facility, especially also bedaquilin, both in a 20 milligram and a 100 milligram tablet form. These tablets are water dis dispersible, whether you use the adult or the um, pediatric formulation, they give reliable levels in children. So just to say there's no reason not to treat children, these drugs are available through publicly um, funded pathways. Um, I won't have time to dwell on all the, the, the WH up updates, but just briefly to say the six month B palms, that's bedaquilin, um, predominant linazolid and moxifloxacin regimen is now endorsed by WHO as the treatment of choice for adults. They didn't give a guidance in children under 15, um, but there's consensus in the pediatric community that it's also the appropriate regimen for children. I'll touch on some of those guidelines. They are older, longer, all oral regimens, uh, which are very complex and I think which no one thinks is optimal anymore. And just to say, in children, there's no reason to use injectables um, anymore. There's far better treatment alternatives. Um, 
Just briefly to touch on the SHINE trial, which is a big trial that have looked at treatment shortening in children with drug-susceptible TB. It essentially showed that children with non-severe TB, classified as you can see there, can be treated for a shorter four-month treatment course. This same rationale can be applied for drug-resistant tuberculosis. And in the, the guidance provided by the Sentinel Group, they um, updated their field guide, and you can find it online, the 2022 version, they've included some of this rationale. So if a child with um, MDR or the suspected MDR TB um, is diagnosed, they can be classified in the same way as severe or non-severe disease, and that will put them in, on different durations. Um, the second most important determinant is whether fluoroquinolone resistance is present or not. In the absence of fluoroquinolone resistance, the, the B palm regimen replacing predominant with the laminate for six, six to nine months is probably, no, we, we believe it's, 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 it's as effective as it is in, in the adult population. If you have fluoroquinolone resistance, then we need to think carefully about the replacement of that quinolone. Um, and we are uncomfortable with just using three drugs as they advise in adults, because in children we get frequent discontinuation of linazolate. So using cyclosirin as your fourth drug would be ideal. Um, so I'm going to end with my last slide just to say whenever we think of MDR treatment, if there's um, tuberculous meningitis uh, involvement of the CNS, we have to think of CSF penetration. Um, so for drug-resistant tuberculosis, just to be aware that there's variable penetration into the CSF, and if you have a child with miliary tuberculosis or TB meningitis, we have to ensure that the treatment regimen adequately includes drugs that penetrates the CSF. Um, I'll stop there and head over to Steve. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Mares.